Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with so many of my fellow Housers and also to see the new generation of Housers joining us for this session. Uh, I want to thank Vince Malta. Vince, are you still in the room? Where's Vince? Uh, for uh, making this a priority for the realtors during your, your time. And I want to thank uh, Megan for putting this together. Megan Booth, thank you very much. Uh, the realtors play an enormous role in communities across the country. And I want to thank the realtors that, you know, their day job is a hard job, but that they make time to make housing affordability uh, an issue in their communities and to share their strength. And then I want to recognize Joe Ventron. Joe's been my mentor for almost most is, but I start my day every day getting an email from Joe Ventron, and it's some type of housing clip or a series of housing clips. So Joe, thank you for keeping me informed. So we're going to talk about uh, the supply of affordable housing during this panel. And I'm going to turn it over to Kent Golden, the Dean of Housing Policy. That's a compliment. Uh, Whatever it means. Kent is going to frame the issue, and then we're going to have a dialogue with Matt and Steve as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. It's uh, great to be here. I'm going to have some slides. If uh, Are they coming up? Ah, great. Um, We'll go through these very quickly. Thank you, Pam. It's always great to be with you. And, uh, and of course, we couldn't start our day without Joe Ventron's email. So uh, I think what we want to talk about is the supply issues. And I don't think it's uh, news to anybody to say that there really is a shortage of housing. And it really is a housing shortage crisis. Um, the, the bottom line is pretty straightforward. Uh, we are now. Uh, forming uh, close to a million two households every year. We're building far below that, so every year we fall behind by somewhere in the range of uh, 300 to 350,000 housing starts that aren't occurring, and that's cumulative, so that crisis, if you will, gets more serious. Uh, there are some numbers that are on the slide. I won't go through them in a lot of depth, but uh, Lori Goodman and Rolf Pendle were some of the first to identify the issue back in 2016, where they talked about a 430 30,000 housing units shortage in 2015. And by the way, I've been involved in this in, in many, many years, this phenomenon of a housing shortage, which has really been around now for the last four or five years in spades, is a, is a new phenomenon, if you will. It's unique, and yet it's a very serious issue. Um, other numbers, uh, Sam Cater at Freddie Mac talks about 370,000 units per year. The Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies obviously identifies it. Why does it exist? Whoops, let me go back. Can I go back one? Oops, there we go. Um, home builders talk about three L's, labor, land, lumber, all very important, won't go through the details. Uh, labor's the most important now. I did a survey of home builders about a year ago. 82% uh, of the single family builders and 86% of the multifamily builders said that was their greatest challenge in terms of trying to build housing that was affordable. Another major issue, we've got our Matt with the counties. Uh, he's involved all the cities. Mayor Bowser was very useful. It's the regulatory issues that really make it tough. Uh, again, a survey that the home builders did not too long ago showed that 24 percent of the cost of a single family house is due to the regulatory issues. Uh, 32 percent of the multifamily house are regulatory issues at the state and local level. Uh, lots of additional complexity that are there. People aren't moving as fast as they used to. Only 10 percent of the people in the country moved last year, 9.8 percent if you wanted to be precise. And therefore, because um, there's a shortage of housing, people are doing all kinds of creative things to survive, doubling up, moving back home, staying at home, uh, thinking about creative ways to use existing lots uh, by on a house that's already there, putting an accessory dwelling unit, ADU, in order to build an additional unit, etc. So lots of things are happening that both add to the complexity and are part of the solution. We spent a lot of time talking about the problem. What I want to spend most of my time talking about is the fact that there's a lot of innovation 
going on around there. About, about two years ago, I was approached by a fellow by the name of Clark Ivory. He's the largest builder in Utah. And, and he said, you know, I'm looking around and seeing a lot of innovation going on at the grassroots local level. Uh, I'm thinking about putting together a, a prize, giving some money to some people to identify what's happening and, and to see if there really is a lot of innovation going on. And he says, will you help me do that? And we talked and, and I said, yeah, that sounds very interesting. And so I'm the chairman, if you will, of an advisory board of uh, I think very good people that are involved. Uh, I won't go through the names, but uh, Harvard, Berkeley, uh, Lori Goodman here in Washington, D.C., lots of others around the country who are part of the advisory board, and, and have tried to identify um, what's happening. So we said, let's look at three areas. Let's look at construction and design. Let's look at finance. Let's look at what's happening on the regulatory policy side. Uh, the first year, we had 126 people that applied. Uh, and, and they were involved in 28 states around the country. We just sort of finished at the end of December, the second year in terms of the applications and the nominations related, and it's up to 168. Uh, lots of interest in terms of what's happening, a lot of creativity. This is the website, you can look Ivory Prize, if you want, you can go to uh, www.ivoryinnovations. Uh, the, the top 25, if you will, for the 2019-2020 cycle are, are, are already identified, and you can see a little bit more about them. Uh, but one of the interesting things, we said, let's step back and try to see. We're not going to solve this as a national problem, but with the innovation that's going on, perhaps we can look at through this ivory prize process, some of the things that point the directions or the paths that will help people at the local level and at the national level identify what's happening. So we've identified five areas. I'll run through them very quickly. Uh, but then maybe we can get into a discussion about it. But the first is to increase housing construction through innovation and technology to build faster, uh, increase productivity, Home building is notoriously uh, negligent with respect to productivity uh, and to lower the costs. Um, interesting uh, contestants in that area every year, a lot of things going on. Uh, one of our winners was Factory OES. Uh, they're in Northern California. They have a factory there. They're not just building one in Southern California. They can produce housing 40% faster. This is multifamily housing. And with a 20% cost reduction. And, and they're doing some interesting things. Second area, Mary, Mayor Bowser talked about this. Preserving, producing affordable housing in neighborhoods. Building on people and strengths in that community. Lots of interesting things happening there. Uh, the third is the finance area, utilizing creative finance approaches to try to help people be able to buy a house. Uh, our two finance winners last year were Home Partners of America in Chicago. They do a, a big lease to own program. They work with realtors. They basically buy houses and then, and then they rent them to people and give them five years to be able to, in essence, qualify and, and build up what they need to do to buy that house and having some interesting success. Landed is doing shared equity in Northern California with teachers. Uh, what they do is they basically pay 50% of the down payment. And they, for that, they get 25% of the equity when the house is either refinanced or sold. Uh, interesting approach to make a difference at the affordable area. Uh, the fourth area is with the shortage, obviously, you have to be creative in terms of allowing people to use the housing that we have more effectively and at the same time to uh, you know, to, to make housing available for people. Uh, one of the interesting things, a group called Nesterly in Boston. If you've been to Boston, you have a lot of triple-deckers. A lot of senior people own those triple-deckers. A graduate student from MIT decided to let's do a platform to match senior people who would like to rent to students. They've had great success. It's a win-win. The students get a place to live. Lots of students in Boston. The seniors not only get rent, but they get company. Uh, 
as they age in place. It's wonderful. And then finally, on the regulatory barrier side, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward. Lots of interesting things, but many of you may have heard this year, two of our finalists are the state of Oregon for what they're doing with state mandated zoning to allow for a town over 25,000. Uh, no more single family zoning. You have to allow duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, cluster zoning uh, within that. M Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, done the same thing. Uh, single family zoning basically done away with uh, so that they uh, certainly required, allow duplexes and triplexes. So lots of interesting things happening. Bottom line is that we're not gonna solve this in any one way, but innovation is gonna be part of the solution one step at a time. Thanks, Kent. So we're going to move on to Steve Frank. Steve is the CEO of the Washington Realtors Association. And Steve, you represent really the private sector. So could you share with us um, how you were successful in building coalitions and also specific examples of what the coalition has been able to accomplish? Um, and then if you would just touch on the unlock the door for affordable home ownership campaign as well. Thank you. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, you heard this morning some discussions about uh, Seattle. And I think we all know that Seattle has uh, just experienced remarkable growth in the last uh, three or four years, a lot of it driven by tech. And so a lot of wealth has come into the city of Seattle. Uh, and then there also have been a lot of issues that have arisen with respect to homelessness and just housing affordability in general. So that's what we tend to think about. But uh, housing affordability is uh, much more, it's a statewide problem in Washington and around the country. So uh, as an example, the Washington Center for Real Estate Research at the University of Washington does a housing affordability index, and the most recent data indicate that in 33 of our 39 counties, uh, housing affordability is a significant issue, especially for first-time home buyers. So uh, what, do you, what do we do about that? Um, one of the things that we first started talking about was how when we took the lead on condominium uh, liability reform. But let me back up even a little bit more on that because that is just, uh, uh, to me, uh, an example of what we call the missing middle, right? On the ladder of home ownership, you've got the, uh, you know each rung on the ladder and uh, to move from the rental rung into the home ownership rung, typically uh, you might move into the more, uh, multi-unit, uh, denser, smaller uh, ownership options, uh, probably uh, epitomized by condominiums. That's the missing middle. Uh, Washington State had probably the most restrictive condominium uh, or the most prohibitive condominium liability laws in the country. So how do we, there were literally no condos were being built in a city like Seattle. So what are we gonna do about that? So Realtors took the lead a few years ago in trying to pass legislation to uh, enact condominium liability reform and it failed. It failed in committee, the committee chair killed it. So we came back in 2018 and said, well, let's go back at it. But then we pulled back and said, wait a minute, uh, there is an opportunity to hear, here to do something much bigger and address uh, housing affordability in a, on a much broader scale. And so that's when we came up with our Unlock the Door for Affordable Home Ownership Initiative. Uh, this is, kind of put it in perspective, not advancing, but um, there are three things I wanted to talk about. One is the, the content of what we tried to accomplish. The next is the messaging. And then finally, the delivery. The content was, rather than just focusing on sort of one area of this massive problem, we put together a package of bills. Uh, there were 16 uh, pieces of legislation that we grouped together under the Unlock the Door uh, rubric. And it ranged everywhere from legislation to assist with our most vulnerable population Populations in terms of um, finding uh, money for infrastructure for homelessness, those sorts of things, uh, all the way to condominium liability reform, to increasing uh, or providing incentives for local jurisdictions to increase density, to increase supply. So it was a very broad-based uh, effort. Uh, the message to deliver that was we had a, with uh, the assistance of the National Association of Realtors, we did a one-month 
over a million dollar uh, multimedia campaign in Washington State. That's, that's a lot of money. And the idea was we wanted to make housing affordability the number one priority for our state legislature. Right, so that is the message that we were trying to deliver. And we wanted to do that in a way that appealed to the broad spectrum of the folks who sit in the Washington State Legislature. Because we all know that for some of our friends in the legislature, when they think of affordable housing, they tend to think of solutions like subsidized housing and, and helping the homeless, which is great. Other of our friends in the legislature tend to think more in terms of regulatory reform or market-based solutions. So what we tried to do was deliver a message that, that addressed that entire spectrum uh, to make it so that affordable housing meant something to everyone. It's not a zero-sum game. And the delivery of that message was uh, to put together a coalition that would present credible voices that could uh, deliver each of those messages. So um, if you look at on well, the next slide, here it is. This uh, kind of, this one slide really sums up everything. Those were all the pieces of legislation that we had, uh, funding for local governments, incentives for affordable and low income housing, regulatory and liability reforms, and on the bottom are the logos of all the folks in our coalition. So it wasn't just a coalition of you know, the typical realtors and lenders and builders. We also included uh, Habitat for Humanity, for example, and and many uh, nonprofits uh, that are working on um, low income housing. We included uh, some of the nonprofits that advocate for the homeless. And uh, in our ads and also in our messaging to the legislature, each of the members of our coalition could deliver a message that is meaningful and impactful. And um, the ultimate result of all of this was great success. So we ended up, of our 16 bills, about 12 of them passed. And here's the key. They all passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, so we were able to achieve that goal of uh, making, we believe, making housing the number one priority uh, in the state of Washington and set that uh, basis for moving forward. Uh, so for example, one of the bills that we did get passed was to provide incentives for increased density at the local level. And I can go into all the details, be happy to talk to you about that later. Uh, but that process has been so successful that we're going back to the legislature this year to build on it and expand the number of cities that are able to take advantage of these incentives. So we're really proud and pleased of, with uh, what we're able to accomplish. Uh, Steve, before we move on, will you just comment on the four pieces <coughs> excuse me, of legislation that did not pass? Um, that's a good question because I'm only focusing on the ones that did. So, <laughs> so I'd have to come back on that one. Right, thanks. thanks. Fair enough. Uh, our next uh, panelist, Matt Chase, he's the CEO and executive director of the National Association of Counties. Matt, you bring the public sector view to the table here, um, and you also have a very complex uh, group of counties in the United States. Every state, counties are set up differently. Some states, like my home state, counties really don't have much power, and my adopted state, Virginia, counties have tremendous power. So if you could comment on what you're doing uh, with your members and the success that you're achieving. Thank you. Great. Well, good morning, and thank you to National Association of Realtors for the invitation to involve county governments, probably one of the most misunderstood levels of government in the country. But we represent a level of government that invests about $600 billion a year in our local communities. I work for 40,000 elected officials, and we have 3.6 million county employees, so 1% of Americans working for counties. Housing has become one of our top three issues. I've been with this group for seven years, and historically our focus has been on roads and bridges. We own 45% of the roads, 40% of the bridges. Health care is huge for us. We own over 1,000 hospitals. And then the criminal justice system really is on the county's shoulders. But in the last couple of years, housing has become definitely a top three, right up there with our jail cost and with our road and bridge cost. And what I, I just want to make four key points. 
One is we really don't have a national vision right now. When we have worked on housing historically, it's been affordable housing, which is really more the low income housing. Now we're focused on housing affordability. And the difference really is we used to really focus on home ownership. And if you go back to post-World War II, there was a huge push in this country for home ownership in the 1950s. And that was to counter communism. That was to really push people to own things. And that was a major national goal. And so it was about building pride and assets, but there was also a huge political re reason for that. And also major, major change coming after World War II. Now when we're talking about housing affordability, we're not focusing on home ownership as much as what is your income versus the price. We're looking at a ratio of can that person afford to live? And right now it looks like over a third of Americans are cost burdened, with many actually extremely cost burdened. The second point I think is we have to have intergovernmental partnerships, federal, state, local, tribal working together, and we have to have public, private, nonprofit working together. And we really need to peel back the onion on what are the different roles and responsibilities of each level of government. The federal government plays a huge role in financing with the Fed, with interest rates, with HUD, with lending. Understanding the difference between funding and financing, those are two different things. Funding is like a grant. Financing is giving someone the ability to borrow money that you have to figure out how to pay back. Those are two very different concepts. And then of course, subsidies. For, from the county level, our tools typically are around taxes, around land use, if we have that authority, around convening power. And so what are those different roles and responsibilities? And our big issue really is state preemption where we are creatures of state government. Counties are literally creatures of state government. And we either have flexibility as a home rule county or what we're called the Dillon rule county, where we can only do what the state tells us we're allowed to do. The third factor that we're seeing, and this is really big, is the global factors, that housing has become global. And you're seeing huge private equity firms get into housing. You're seeing sovereign wealth funds get into housing. And you're seeing this in the big cities in San Francisco. If you go to Honolulu, most of the development isn't American. It's not local. It's mostly Chinese. If you go to different parts of Miami, for example, huge flows of international money coming into there. So it's not a local issue. It's really understanding the global context. We're seeing through our economic research really the, the missing middle and what the wealth disparities and what's happening. Uh, you have to understand counties funding comes from property tax. That's primarily our key source. So we also sometimes will get sales tax and, and some other things or fees on real estate transactions. But our incentives are to build bigger houses that you can tax more. I mean, that's, that's what the incentives are built in through how our, our structure is set up. So really understanding what's going on. The shared economy is also really causing opportunity and crisis in some communities where a lot of the local housing stock is being taken off the market and put into Airbnb or VRBO. I've got one rural county in upstate New York. It's a small county, 4,000 people. Only 13% of the housing stock is available to local people. It's either secondary homes or now folks buying up for rental property for basically Airbnb. And then so I'll just close with the, the importance of incentives and not economic incentives, but behavior incentives. That we really need to look at the economic, social, political, and in our case, often the revenue incentives. And how do we get those aligned so that we're making better decisions? So what we're doing is really educating our members about data. We're, we've created housing affordability profiles for every county in the country where the decision makers can go on our website, click on their county, have a one page profile that shows what is going on with housing affordability. So as they start to make their policies and their investment decisions, they can be a little bit more educated on truly what's going on with the numbers. Matt, that index is fascinating. So how many counties are there in the United States? Well, we have 3,069 county governments. You'll see the census report more. Those are census 
geographies, but there's 3,069. So just to put it into perspective, 50% of the American population lives in about 150 counties. The other 50% lives in 2,900. So we represent LA County with 10 million people. It'd be the seventh largest state. You know, they have 110,000 employees and a $36 billion budget to Loving County, Texas with about 100 people. Thank you. Kent, we're going to turn back to you, and uh, I'd like you to elaborate on the three L's. Uh, I learned this from Kent back when we uh, were working together at the Bipartisan Policy Center Housing Commission, and I think it's a very good way to, to um, explain to people what the problem is. So if you could spend a minute on that. And also uh, a second um, question, the regulatory barriers. You talked about the single family uh, regulatory barriers contributing 24.3% and then a, a astounding 32.1% for multifamily structures. Can you monetize that? What does that mean to the homeowner or to the renter? Thank you. Uh let me, let me just start with the three L's, I guess, because you asked two good questions, Pam. Thank you very much. Um, f first of all, on the three L's, it, it, it's first is labor, second is land, and the third is lumber. Now, lumber prices actually are going down, so it's really a broader category. It's the cost of building materials that really are related to that. And, and that probably explains some of the challenges that home builders face. And, and I said quickly that labor is the biggest issue. Um, that used to, I mean, to be candid before, issues with respect to illegal immigration became so challenging. Uh, th that was not an issue for home builders. And, and, and too much housing was being built before the Great Recession back in 2005, 2006, 2007, and labor was available. But all of a sudden, it tightened up. Lots of people left the country, and, uh, and that's really a big issue. And so right now, the real focus in the home building industry is to how can we get greater labor? And a lot of that's turning to let's go to high schools, let's allow people who may not want to get a college education but want to have a great job to get into the construction industry. And there's a lot of that that's beginning to happen. And over time, that may be the solution. But that's an issue. Land, that's just supply and demand. And, and a lot of it does have to do with the regulatory side in terms of making land available to build housing and then the cost of building materials. Back to the regulatory. just address, uh, and, and this is one where we have a bit of a discussion. Uh, you know, you, you try to monetize that. It, it, so that really means if you've got a $150,000 house and you want to say at least 25% of that house has to do with the cost of regulation, then you're really talking about $40,000. I mean, it's huge in terms of, of how big the cost of regulatory issues are. Now, a lot of those are just going to exist because, you know, part of them come from time. The longer it takes, if it takes you three years to do a project, that adds cost as opposed to getting it quick. On the regulatory side, did a survey of home builders and said, what are the top issues for regulatory? First is zoning. And that's what Minneapolis, that's what Oregon are dealing. And, and there really are interesting coalitions that are beginning to form with respect to zoning that didn't exist before, where you know, it used to be the home builders and the realtors and the traditional people were saying, you know, we can't build housing. But now it's uh, people who are concerned about racial discrimination. Uh, you know, zoning is probably one of the most discriminatory practices that we've ever had you know, in terms of, of what the impact is. So those coalitions are coming together, and zoning may change in some areas, like it is in Oregon and Minneapolis. Um, but, but the other issue is permitting. It's, it's the, getting the approvals and the permits. And in some local jurisdictions who say, we're going to make that a priority, they can do that in three months. They can do that in six months. Others, it takes three, four, five years. And that's what really adds to those costs if you want to try to monetize those. So it's huge. The, 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 here's an interesting statistic, and then I'll let somebody else speak. But, but between uh, 1960 and 2007, which is the beginning of the Great Recession, the average number of housing starts in the country was was a million and a half, 1.5 million. In 2007, 
in terms of, of doing that. Last year, you know, we sort of had the best year we've had in a long time, and it was 1.29 million. If, if household formation, and actually with the baby boomers, you know, they've moved on and, and they're aging in place now. Everybody said they were gonna give up their house. Well, they're not. So that hasn't helped on the shortage problem. But, but for the millennials, you know, they wanna buy a house. But, but, and they're forming households now at a great rate. They are the home buyers, if you will, of the future that the realtors are selling to. But, but the reality is, they're not able to do it because of the cost of a house and because of those regulatory barriers. And we really are 350, 300,000 units short every year. And that's a serious issue. If you don't build a million five, you're in trouble. We've got to figure out a way. And the biggest way to do that is on the regulatory side to get more land. Thank you, Kent. So Steve, you've had tremendous success. You went uh, to the legislature the first time and you guys were not successful. So it's very impressive that you went back and went back with not just a, a, a small increase, but a tremendous increase in, in the number of issues. Everyone in this room now knows what you've done in, in Washington state and I congratulate you on that. How can you share this with the realtors across the nation? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Well, I think the model that we used was uh, uh, very successful in advocating for policies that not just benefit our members uh, and our communities, but the broad spectrum of housing opportunities that we need. Uh, so kind of getting back to what we talked about before, for many years, the, the battle uh, from our perspective was just about helping people to understand the need to build more more housing. And uh, there was a lot of uh, effort to uh, push back on growth in general, right? And so for us, one of the, call it the money line of our campaign uh, that you'll see in our ads is uh, one of our uh, uh, members of Congress, Denny Heck, who commented that what we need is more houses of all types for all of our neighbors. Uh, throughout Washington State, so really, you know, that fundamental acceptance of the of the supply need, uh, and then again, uh, reaching out to address the different approaches that people come to the table with. This is what I want to achieve. This is how I, this is what I want to accomplish, and uh, recognizing that there are. Uh, many ways to achieve what we're all trying to, to achieve. So, for example, um, realtors might be seen as, uh, realtors are promoting home ownership, but our program also recognized the importance of building more apartments, just building more housing, uh, and then working on that middle, uh, that missing middle. So the comprehensive approach where nobody's trying to win, uh, it's not a zero sum game, uh, I think is, to me, that was the, the biggest takeaway from, uh, from what we did. And then when you go back to just, for example, the condominium liability reform, just that one specific issue, uh, what happened was we, frankly, we got clobbered and uh, couldn't even get it out of committee. And so what we did was we went back and developed a working group with uh, folks from, uh, with all perspectives, both from the condominium developer side and the, the homeowner association side and uh, sat down with the committee chair and worked out a workable solution so that the committee chair who the year before had killed our bill became our biggest champion uh, and really helped us to get it through the legislature. So that willingness and ability to listen and build those consensuses, to me, that was the biggest takeaway. Thanks, Steve. So Matt, housing uh, is not necessarily headline news every day. Um, when Kent and I were working together back, I think in 2011, we went and actually clipped newspapers when people had newspapers, and the headlines were dominated by the foreclosure crisis. And then as the housing market began to recover, we didn't hear that much about it. Um, I'm pleased that this administration has embraced this challenge. You know, the president has created the uh, White House Council on Eliminating Regulatory Barriers. The realtors are playing a huge role by responding to the request for information. How can we get this message out that there is an opportunity to make a difference by responding to this initiative? 
Yeah, I think it's a great point. And to Ken's point about regulations, both what the federal government is doing as well as what we can do at the local level, that's definitely on our radar. I'm going to North Carolina tomorrow. The president will be there with Secretary Carson for a housing summit. This is definitely on our radar. Going back to what I was saying about incentives, we have a saying in the, in the private sector, we celebrate innovation. In the public sector, you investigate it. And that's a challenge. And whether it's cities and counties and in the gotcha game of media and bloggers, how you have to remember elected officials are elected, right? So what what are their incentives there to, to get the majority to like them? So and then on a career side, some of these programs have become so burdensome to, to administer. The HUD Community Development Block Grant Program or the HOME Program, and for good reason. You know, there, there are sometimes abuses that, that catch on in the media, and then we overcorrect and we make it so onerous to use. And so we lose sight of what was the purpose of the program and how do we have really good deliverables. We're seeing, I think as Kent said, we're seeing a lot of counties really starting to look at their data, recognize they have a problem, and really start to look at how can they streamline their permitting? How can they work with the building community? We, we have to work with the nonprofit communities in the neighborhoods. People are going to protect what they have. And so if, if a neighborhood has, a, has great schools and, and great values in their houses, they don't want apartments coming in, right? So they're going to they're gonna fight to protect that. So going back to incentives, like how do we get them aligned, really understand everybody's perspective. But we're working with this administration on a lot of the federal regulatory reforms, and we're having to deal with our own reforms at the local level. It's going to take everybody coming together. We're not going to shy away from that, that some of our members, we have to do a better job. Okay. Can I just sure. Can comment on that very quickly? First of all, I, I do want, sometimes uh, HUD can take a bad rap from a lot of people. What they're doing, there have been six commissions or government efforts related to regulatory barriers over the last 30 years. The reality is, is this group, this White House Council, is probably making more progress than any of the other did. So I really have to take my hat off for the fact that they're really going after it. And the reality is, again, because there is a shortage, I think local governments and state governments are beginning to recognize we've got to do something. So there is kind of a window of opportunity that didn't exist 10 years ago. And, and you crack the barrier. But I think for all of us, as we go back to what our local and state operations are, there are opportunities out there to make a difference that did not exist four or five years ago because of the crisis that we face now. So without, without making this a, a climate panel, take the HUD Community Development Block Grant Program, though, which is funded at around $3 billion a year, give or take. In these last couple of years, they've administered over $80 billion in HUD CDBG disaster aid. Right, so a program that typically administers $3 billion a year in grants got an infusion of over $70 billion in 2018 for disaster aid. That contributes to our regulations. We're, we're experiencing about 20 to 25% of each of our counties having a FEMA presidential de disaster declaration each year. So 830 counties. That, that plays into our housing regulations that we're having to impose different housing codes if you're in Florida and you see a hurricane come through, you can tell which codes were the 1970 codes, 1990 codes, or current codes were those houses built to. The ones that are still standing, newer codes. The ones that are gone, probably the older codes. And so that does cost money, but we got to find that balance because there's federal regulations on flood insurance. There's all sorts of housing lending rules. And then, of course, you got American disabilities, all these different things that we're dealing with. Not to say they're excuses, but they're just realities, and we have to really think through the balance. You know, one, yeah, th one thing I'd like to add uh, is, so we've talked about 
uh, regulations and zoning and financing and all the all the things that I think we typically associate with trying to address uh, housing affordability issues. But uh, another one, and this is where the federal government, in my view, can play a very significant role, is infrastructure. And uh, you know, we we can't do these things without the basic infrastructure that it takes to be able to uh, drill it down to the county level and the city level. So again, this isn't an infrastructure panel, but uh, that is an element that I, I think we don't want to forget about. I, I would argue housing is infrastructure, and I did. <laughs> uh, so NIMBYism, I, I think that uh, Doug Bibby has probably spent a good part of his career combating this. Doug's sitting back there. and. Um, when Jack Kemp had his regulatory um, commission, his regulatory barriers commission, it was called Not In My Backyard, and that report today is as relevant as it was when uh, Jack Kemp, Kemp was secretary of HUD. I think people are afraid to approach this. Um, I've experienced it sitting on the, the uh, commission side of the table for uh, sitting on a planning board, watching people come in that are outraged. So. I would consider this maybe the single greatest barrier to development, certainly, of affordable housing, and if, I'd like the panelists to comment on that. Well, I think you saw, like, the mayor has a plan. Is it perfect? You know, we'll see. But, but she's getting out there in the community. And the best way to combat it is to have conversations and to get people to start having dialogue and to understand the perspective. Because in today's world, people see a tweet or a Facebook post and they make all sorts of assumptions, often not factually based. And so going out in the community is really important. And we have all sorts of acronyms, NIMBYism. There's, there's CAVE, Citizens Against Virtually Everything. You know, there's, there's a whole, we have a whole list. But the bottom line is, again, that they have the right to their opinion. They're trying to protect what they have. But how do you engage them in a conversation? And I would just say on the infrastructure piece, you know, in these communities that are high growth, Infrastructure is expensive. You look at Montgomery County, Maryland, they're averaging, I think they're, they were averaging about 2,000 new students a year in their school system. Uh, 2,000 students, you need to build a new school. That's about $100 million a school. And so, in addition to water and sewer and everything, the changing patterns can be expensive. The mayor mentioned D.C. was 800,000 people in 1950. It went down to 520,000 people in the 2000s, and it's back up over 700,000. That's tough to plan. And when you're talking about the infrastructure that goes with it, this financing is 30 years old, 30-year borrowing periods. You know, it's tough to figure out how, how far, how fast, to you go. I, I just, I just might add a little bit to that because I think that makes a lot of sense. What, what I've sort of seen over the years is activity, both by citizens at the local level, or by community leaders, or by alternatively community officials, really can make a difference. And and the opportunity is there. So, you know, one of our finalists for the Ivory Prize was Buncombe County, North Carolina. We were just talking about that. This is in Asheville, North Carolina. You would never heard of Buncombe County, but it's you've heard bumpkin, of that. It's not bump, bump, bumpkin. It's bumpkin. Yeah. Yeah. Buncombe. Buncombe. C O M B. But you know, the reality is. Um, what they've tried to do, because they've got a lot of second homes, they've got a population of residents who, in fact, can't afford to live in their community, but, but with the combination of zoning, um, looking carefully at the permitting you know, process and, and the way that they develop housing and working with the local home builders and realtors and others to, to perfect that process and a variety of other things that they've done, some county funding, they've actually made a gigantic difference in terms of what they're doing. Um, you know, we talked about Oregon, we talked about Minneapolis. I really do think that the window is there, but, but it's, a, it's, it's gonna happen one innovation, one local government, one state government at a time. And I think we're gonna have to do what Steve talked about, which is to build the coalitions, now using a little bit more diversity in what those can do to come together and say, we gotta do something about the housing shortage. Thank just you. Just to add to that real, real quick, if there's one point 
that this this housing affordability challenge is not just San Francisco and New York City. It's every county. We are seeing this in the most rural counties in central Nebraska to the Great Plains to it's it's every community just about or every state has it's an urban rural suburban problem. It's not just the big metropolitan counties. Yeah, and that's what I had started off with uh, the housing affordability index in in Washington state affects 33 of our 39 counties. So couldn't agree more. But that also uh, to me is part of what's going to advance this conversation uh, because this isn't just a Seattle thing and the rest of the state just says that's Seattle's problem. It's everybody's issue and there are ways to have these conversations and I'd like to think that we kind of help to figure some of that out. So there you go. Right. We only uh, we don't have any time left, but I want to ask one final question, Megan, if it's okay. Um, on Tuesday night, we heard the president talk about opportunity zones. This is um, certainly a tax credit that could have a meaningful impact on on the development of affordable housing. And my question for any one of the panelists: Are you beginning to see investments in distressed communities in affordable housing? Not, not so much where I am. Uh, there was, there's some political issues, but not so much where I am. We're, we're seeing some, but this would be a whole other panel discussion that the Opportunity Zone program was actually supposed to be a business startup program. It's now become a real estate program. So if you go back and look what the Econo Economic Innovation Group did, EIG, when they really dreamed up this concept, it was about helping startups in distressed areas. That po Since the recession, the number of startups in distressed communities has plummeted, and they're concentrated in a certain number of under uh, high growth areas areas. Their goal was to bring wealth opportunities back to distressed communities. And now it's become a real estate program. So I got to end on a positive note. So I'm going to be on a panel at the end of the month with ULI. And I had three developers on the phone yesterday. And one of them was HCD um, in New York City. And I asked this gentleman if, he's, if they are seeing investments. And New York City answered, absolutely. So I want to thank the panelists and thank the National Association of Realtors for this opportunity. And I want to thank all the housers in the audience for what you do every day. Thank you. Thank you.